I think many people over the last several years, as information has become more available, have become aware that there is a large number of people in the field of dentistry who don't seem to understand that the mouth is part of the body. It's something completely separate and doesn't relate to any of your, of your other physiology whatsoever. But we're very lucky to have with us today someone who does. Dr. Daniel Vinograd is a naturopathic dentist, and he is the dentist to many people at the Gerson Institute as well. And he is going to tell you how it might be done in a better world. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you all. Uh, with this weather, I would expect half of you would be down at the beach, so I got to commend you for being here. Uh, who do you trust? So maybe we're going to start thinking a little big here to start out the session, but uh, who do you trust? Uh, we have so much information nowadays, sometimes too much information, it used to be that if we had to find something out, uh, I remember as a young person, I had to actually hire a research team to find out anything I wanted to know or go to the library. And now it's like, right? It's right here. And so I get a lot of patients coming in and saying, Doc, I read this. And this is what is best, this or that. And you know, and it's, it seems to me that some people that have done some great research, but all of a sudden they have too much information. They don't know what to do with it. Uh, I think a lot of that applies to dentistry. What's good, what's bad, what materials, root canals, this, that, right? So, uh, so again, the question is, who do you trust? Should you trust me just because I'm standing here? Absolutely not. Um, and I'd like to propose to you that if we really start thinking big outside of the box, uh, you really, whether you're religious or not, uh, there's a concept that I think is important to understand, is that if you have a very scientific mind, you have to understand that we are right now, us sitting here, each one of you, we're a result of a billion and a half years of evolution. Wow. I mean, talking about thinking big, right? You will have a religious inclination. You could say there's incredible godliness inside of each one of us. So when I say, who do you trust, there's really none, no better answer than yourself. We just need to learn how to listen, because we are full of information. Every cell in our body, as a scientist, I think, has a billion and a half years of evolution. What does that mean? It's been learning. Every cell has been learning up to this point. So. When people say, you know, I have this feeling or there's some intuition, we've been learning how to disregard that. The only thing we really should pay attention to is what our mind dictates, right? And, and I think that's a mistake, you know? In, in Chinese medicine, they talk about heart-mind heart as one entity. And I think they got it right, you know? We tend to disregard and start just thinking up here, making decisions just from here. So, it's very, I think it's very important for us to really understand, to trust our decisions, to trust ourselves, and to trust our instincts. Does that mean that you're going to make decisions all by yourself without any knowledge? No. Does that mean that you don't want to rely on experts? No. But you have to use that intuition to know who you trust, what information you trust, who's trying to sell you something, right? And who's really trying to give you information that you can rely on. So. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, this is my first point. We really must take responsibility for our own health. We just have to. Why? Because there's so many interests out there that are really looking to get our hard-earned dollars. And they'll say anything to get into our pockets, right? Having said that, there are wonderful people out there. I've spent many, many years going down to Guatemala and Peru, and I've had interaction with incredible doctors, dentists that give off their time, 
are incredible people. So there are lots of people out there that are just incredible people. But having said that, corporate America is not necessarily looking out for our interest. And so from now on, or maybe 10 years back, when the, uh, you know, the corporations started basically taking over and influencing governments and so forth uh, to push their agendas, we have to start advocating for ourselves. You know, you cannot trust what people tell you on TV, on the radio, on the print. Uh, it's just unreliable now. Is there some truth in some of that, that information? Yeah, of course there is truth to, to some of the things that they're saying, but we cannot count on that. So uh, talking, let's, let's now talk a little bit about dentistry, how that relates to everything that we're actually talking about right now. And uh, I, I remember one of my very, very dearest friends, uh, Boris Schwartzman, a nice guy from Mexico City. Uh, he was studying at UCLA and he was part of the dental materials program. And he kept on telling me, Daniel, we're studying this material, and I have to tell you, I'm so excited. It's got so-and-so compression strength, and this bonding capabilities, and this sheer strength, and this dimensional stability. And he's talking to me, and I say, it sounds like I'm talking to an engineer, not a health professional. And not him, but the whole department is looking at all this, right? And I say, well, has anybody really thought about the physiological effects of these materials? After all, we're not going to be constructing robots. We're putting them on people's mouths. So I kept on asking him, how about the biocompatibility of these materials? Is anybody studying that? And, you know, I mean, I wasn't born yesterday, so it's about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, that we had this conversation, right? Uh, so, you know, this is the result of that kind of thinking. Were they thinking uh, evil thoughts uh, about poisoning people? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. There was just a disregard. The, the thinking was one of looking at materials to see what is going to be strong enough to withstand mastication forces, which is really a big part of the industry, too. You have to have that as well. So. Uh, uh, you know, that resulted in dental, amal uh, dental amalgams, uh, formaldehyde being placed in children's mouths. Uh, you know, it's just uh, a great deal of e evidence uh, showing how a lot of these materials are so toxic that you wonder, how is it that we even thought about putting them in people's mouths to start out with? Um, and, you know, we talk, we we're going to show a little bit of evidence, evidential uh, uh, studies that show how the body, the mouth and the body are connected. Uh, you know, part of the Industrial Revolution and the specialization all created situations where doctors became more and more specialized. And all of a sudden, this guy was a specialist in lungs. And this guy was a specialist in the right toe. And so by the end of the day, we're looking at little microcosms of things, right? But we really stopped separating everything. We started separating the fact that every part is connected, right? Everybody knows that song, right? The shoulder bone connected to the, right? It's all connected. Uh, so uh, uh, again, you know, traditional root canals were a result of that as well. People just looking for some kind of very practical way to solve a problem. Did they solve some problems? Absolutely. Did they bring other problems about? Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about mercury amalgams. And this is quite interesting. In, 19, in, in 1833 is when they first came, the amalgams were brought to this country by a couple of Frenchmen. And you know, they, people started going crazy about amalgams because all of a sudden you had something really hard there you can place, and people could go back and chew. Right? I mean, so that was, yay, let's hear it for amalgam. But these are our first heroes. The Society of Dental Surgeons, ASDS. Those are, those are the first guys that dressed up in Superman and Batman uniforms, you know? They had this awareness back in 1844 in saying, hey, mercury is one of the most toxic substances known to man. And if you wanted to be part of them, and they were like the most prestigious institution, if you wanted to be, to, to be part of them, 
you had to sign something that said you would not use amalgam. So, wow, you know, back then somebody had some awareness. But, uh, you know, soon after that, uh, by 1856, uh, the, this group disbanded, and the present American Dental Association took over. Are, is the Dental American Association the enemy? No. But again, you know, they have a certain focus. They have a certain history. There was a big component of the new American Dental Association that was called the American Amalgamist Association that was really a subgroup of this that were really uh, pro-amalgam. And this is where really the foundations of the use of, of mercury amalgam. However, we know that mercury is one of the most toxic elements known to humans. How are we living with that kind of... And, and you know, some people say, well, you know, the amalgam gets mixed, the mercury gets mixed with uh, a lot of the silver and cadmium, and, and, and it, it gets fixated. Who knows? I don't know that. And whether it's true or not true, do I want to have that in my mouth, whether people decide whether it, it, it does or it doesn't? There's some good studies that show that definitely there's leakage of mercury. So I, I'm, I'm convinced. But even if the people are not convinced and they say, you know, amalgam really stable and it doesn't hurt anything, well, why would I want to take a chance of putting something that's 50% mercury in my mouth, right? Now, this is, this is not me. This is not some holistic dentist telling you this. This is the Department of Health and Human Services. The United States government is telling you mercury is number three most toxic element that they have found. So in the 1970s, I began to ask my colleagues to stop using amalgam. I mean, I say, you know, we don't, they kept on saying, it's safe. I said, well, you don't know that. Do you agree that mercury is toxic? Yes, I agree that mercury is toxic. Well, whether we find out or, or don't find out, why would you want to start using this? Right? I mean, why, why would you want to use this at all? And this is mostly the answer that I got. <laughs> why isn't that your dentist telling you what's on the label? These are the labels from amalgams. You can read for yourself what, what the manufacturers are telling you, or me as a dentist, about amalgam, right? And I know in this country, there's still, amalgam is still widely used. So we can't change the world all at once, but you know, it's people like you that have awareness, that care, that are here instead of sitting out on the beach. That, uh, that this message is important for. This is what I see in my practice every day. These are amalgams. These are restorations. There are a couple of problems with the restorations. One, from a biocompatible point of view, we've already discussed the content of one of the most toxic materials that there are. And, I mean, as time goes by, they, they get oxidized, they break up, they start leaking. So this is very commonplace in every dentist practice. This is what we're seeing after amalgam has been in, in the mouth. And, and you'd be surprised. Some of this, I'll ask a patient, well, how long has this been in your mouth? Some of them will say, you know, since I was a little kid. Other people will tell me two, three years, and amalgams start looking like this. Now, the other problem that we're having with amalgams is that an amalgam is very hard, and with time, it starts expanding. It starts, and when it starts expanding, it starts actually breaking away from the tooth, and it is so hard that it starts cracking teeth. And I don't know if, uh, if you can see here, uh, I don't have the, uh, but can you see the crack line here? Is that easy to see in one here? As after removing the amalgam, you can sometimes see the crack lines, and they're so common. I probably do 30 or 40 crowns a month from people that have had cracks from amalgams. Of course, I, I see a lot more amalgam restorations than most dentists because of what I do, and people want to get them out. But, but still in all, it's, it's incredible. I, you know, half of the amalgams that we take out have cracks on the teeth already, if they've been in there for any period of time. So even from 
the physical point of view, from the engineering point of view, this is a material that is doomed to fail. So hopefully in five, 10 years we can be sitting here and this lecture will be stored somewhere because amalgam will no longer be used. That's my hope. And this is, you know, before and after. Uh, there are so many ways that now to clean up a mouth, to get rid of a lot of those restorations. And we have materials that can actually do the job for us and uh, remove all that toxicity and the possibility of cracks. And, you know, a lot of the teeth crack and we end up having to think, uh, do we need to do a root canal now? God forbid, do we need to extract the tooth? You know, what do we do with a cracked tooth now? Sometimes we can repair them, sometimes we put a crown on them. A lot of times we lose the tooth. So it's good to, if anybody here has amalgams, you know, when you get home, good thing to really revisit the issue and see if you can get cleared of that, both from a physical point of view, from a systemic point of view. Now, this is one of the biggest questions that I get asked all the time. People call my office. Uh, well, what protocol do you follow? And it's the same person that has been looking in the internet for two weeks and researching, which is a good thing, right? And, uh, and you know, there are quite a number of protocols that people follow. Uh, International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, I'm a member of that. They have their own protocol. Then Hal Huggins, he's really considered the father of modern holistic dentistry. He's got his protocol and many va variations of the above. Uh, I suggest if you're gonna ask your dentist what protocol you follow, that he may give you a, w an answer that you wanna hear. Oh, I follow Al Huggins' protocol. Oh, great, I'm coming, you know? Or I follow the uh, International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. Great. So, uh, uh, my, my suggestion to you is that these protocols are very good guidelines. It's important, but don't take your eye off the eight ball. What does that mean? That means that the best of protocols, if it's not carried out meticulously, is as good as no protocol at all. So uh, the quality, that, and again, we're going to talk about trusting your instincts trusting who you're going you know when when you find somebody that can you you can really resonate with and you trust that's the person that you want to go to versus somebody that was recommended to you in the internet or or is following such a protocol or another and for example you know one of the main most important things in uh, removing amalgams is a rubber dam a rubber dam, uh, uh, many of you are familiar with, maybe others are not, but it's just a physical barrier. And in our office, we actually set the, this up, and then we actually go in here and seal it off with a wax so that we actually have a hermetic seal on the area, and you're not going to be ingesting any of what's being removed. Uh, so there are a lot of things that dentists must do to do it safely, because you don't want to remove it. It's like asbestos. You don't want to remove asbestos unless you have somebody who knows what they're doing, otherwise you're going to be reintroducing it into the environment. And this is the same thing. You don't want to reintroduce that into your body. So these are some of the basics if you guys are looking for a dentist that is going to do this properly. First is uh, you want to prevent the direct intake uh, with a very well-placed rubber dam, meticulously well-placed rubber dam. And the other part is about you know, preventing gas intake, uh, and that has to do with a good oxygen mask, a good ventilation, a power vacuum, a electronic, an electronic handpiece, an electric handpiece, is one where you can actually lower the RPMs and you can actually segment the amalgam so it'll come out in pieces rather than to have to grind the whole thing out. Uh, so, you know, keep in mind some of these things, and uh, uh, this is what you're really looking for when you're looking for somebody. Or if you want to recommend a, a dear one in your family is looking for the right kind of person to do this for you. So in our office, in addition to that, we use homeopathy. We are very lucky because in our office we have big windows. We can aerate the whole area often. Uh, it, we do nutritional guidance and quadrant dentistry, which means we take a segment of the mouth, 
clean it up at once, and you know we're not doing one or two teeth at a time. Well, so now patients are demanding a little bit more healthier alternatives to what we had before. And from the time 30 years ago where people were calling me uh, a quack, pardon the pun here, <laughs> and we're getting a lot more people following the lead now. So uh, glad, glad, glad to say that, glad to report to you guys that there's more and more consciousness, not, not only amongst the public, but perhaps because of the public, dentists are beginning to respond. Okay. And let's shift gears a little bit, and we'll have a few moments for questions after, after this, if, you, if you'd like. And what we're talking about, uh, how we start viewing the human body as sections, as individual sections, and, you know, oh, my God, maybe it's my liver, well, maybe it's, but nothing functions in a vacuum in the body. Everything is connected. And how, what have we found about the mouth and the physiological connection? Well, a lot of research has shown, particular research has been done on heart disease and how uh, bacterial infections in the mouth actually are uh, affecting the heart. Now, if you go and do your research, you're going to find actually articles that say no link. There's absolutely no link. And you're going to find articles that are going to show a definitive link. So for me to come and say there's an absolute link that has been shown scientifically to be the case, not the case. It's not true. However, they have found that a lot of the bacteria that hide in the, in the gums, and many of you probably know the difference, they're mostly anaerobic bacteria. Anaerobic bacteria are the kind that doesn't like aerobics, air. They actually hide in the gums because they are deadly afraid of oxygen, right? And that's how they actually um, get their colonies to proliferate. And, uh, you know, once you start getting gum disease and you start getting the space between the gum and the tooth is very important because that's where the bacteria actually hides itself, yes? And after we start getting three or four millimeters of depth in the pockets between the tooth and the gum, the bacteria start cheering because, hey, we're untouched now. They can't get to me, right? At two or three millimeters, you can get in with your toothbrush and clean it out every day. Once you get four or five millimeters, that be, becomes a serious problem because the bacteria are untouched, unharmed, and unexposed to, to air. So these are, you know, what we see in the office too, more advanced stage. And for example, when you see this area right here, uh, if I would take a, a probe, a little instrument, and go down here, most likely than not, my instrument will go way down to here. This is where the bottom of the pocket would be. And so we have all this area right here. The toothbrush can probably access that. And all this area that down here that is no longer accessible and, uh, and creating a lot of, a lot of damage. So this is what we're talking about. This is the gum. This would be healthy with a very little space here. This is unhealthy when we start having very, very deep pockets here. Now, why am I putting so much emphasis into the pockets in your gums? Because these are the organisms that we find, the anaerobic organisms that we find inside the gums that we're also finding in heart disease same, same bacteria we're finding in heart that is diseased. And lately, in, uh, they found the same bacteria in pancreatic cancer. Wow. Well, there's no study that's showing that there's a direct link. But by golly, if I'm finding the same bacteria here that I'm finding here and I'm finding here, well, I suspect, you know? I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I would not wait for the definitive research, which may take another 20 years, for me to, to know that this is not a good situation, that I don't want that anaerobic bacteria inside my gums. So what do we do? So in the past, what we've done is basically brushed our teeth. And it's amazing to me that more dentists do not take the time to teach people how to brush their gums properly. 
Uh, out of 100 patients that I get, 95 patients have never had any instruction on how to properly brush their gums. Not their teeth, we we're talking about the gums, yes? So part of the traditional hygiene is still very much uh, of, of great importance, yes? Uh, how to properly brush your gums. I usually instruct my patients to brush their gums just with water and take some time and physically get in there and remove the bacteria from the pockets. And then they can actually go ahead, put some toothpaste on or whatever they like to use, and brush their teeth as a separate activity. But I like th them to give the gums a lot of attention for, for the reasons that we've already explained. And of course, the dental floss does the job the, br the, the toothbrush cannot do. However, what has happened is in my practice, I've had people that come with five, six, seven, eight millimeter pockets. In the past, what do we do with these patients? Well, most dentists will do what we call deep scaling. I'm sure some of you have either had it or heard of people that have had deep, deep scaling. Well, deep scaling is fine and good. It's a wonderful procedure. But if you're going to see the dentist once every six months and he does a deep scaling for you, well, what happens between the two appointments? Right? All these bacteria are still growing in there. So uh, the second thing we would tend to do is we actually trim those gums back, which is called gum surgery. And we'd cut them back. The roots would get exposed. Uh, they get very sensitive. It's probably the lesser of the two evils to have all this bacteria there or to have your gums trimmed back. But it's not a pleasant thing to have longer roots and sensitivity and all that. So. I know some of my patients saying, Doc, what else can we do? Can we do something else? Well, of course, you don't want to continue to have that bacterial count in there. But there was one particular patient, a dear, dear patient of mine, her name is Judy. And she said, Doc, I just don't want to get rid of my teeth. Her teeth are dangling, big pus pockets, seven, eight, 10 millimeter pockets. And she says, Doc, there's no conversation here. I'm not doing anything about this. Well, I said, Judy, we need to really talk about the bio biological component of this, you know? So, so we got her to get a water pick, and this was many, many years ago, but Judy's still my, um, the, the, the uh, one individual that really uh, motivated me to, to develop this technique. And then we got her to start using the water pick. When she started using the water pick and got proficient at it, which sometimes takes a week or two to get comfortable with it, we added an ozone machine. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with ozone. Many dentists use ozone. Uh, my feeling is that ozone is a little bit irritating when it's in the air, but once you get it in water, it's very safe. And ozone, O3, right, we're, over, we're supercharging the water with oxygen. So if we can actually deliver that oxygenated water into those deep pockets, what's happening to the anaerobic bacteria? They're dying on contact. They hate it. So the ozone, I, we know, will kill anaerobic bacteria. We know that. But how do we deliver it to six, seven, eight millimeter pocket? We use a water pick. So suddenly, uh, ozone machines used to be a couple thousand dollars. Uh, they're no longer that, you know, they're much, much less than that today. And so we have now gotten a lot of our patients on this protocol, the ozonizer with the water pick. And by the way, Judy is still has her teeth. The pockets are still, you know, the 10 millimeter pockets became eights and the six became fours, so there's improvement, but eight millimeter pockets are still n not a good place to be, right? But however, she can go every day and clean them out. So those bacteria that could possibly travel into your system are no longer a challenge for her. Now, uh, you want to use them in a well ventilator. A lot of people asked me last time I was here, where do I get the, this uh, ozone generators and so forth? So I'm going to tell you generally what you want. You want to use them in a well ventilated area, first of all. Then you want one that is a corona discharge. This is the kind of, of, uh, of machine that if you choose to do it, I want you to, to look for. You want 1,000 milligrams per hour, which is a powerful machine enough that you don't have to sit for three hours 
uh, really uh, ozonizing your, your, uh, your water. Uh, this will probably do it in about 15 minutes. And then you want a sealed box around the elements because there are a lot of people who are making them at home now. And I do not recommend that you actually get one a homemade unit. I will, you need to get something that is well sealed in a box. Uh, now, this bodypure.com, this is actually my son's company. And uh, I asked him to please uh, source the, the machine that I wanted. So if you guys don't find it anywhere else, you can always find it with him. I'm not promoting that you get it from him. If you get it cheaper or everywhere else, it's fine. But I asked him that to get the machine that I wanted in his website. So you can always get it there if you find it nowhere else. Uh, now what about the water irrigation device, the water pick? You want to get as inexpensive a uh, device as you can get it. It really doesn't matter. All you need is one that has a container, because they have some that are just individuals. You don't want that, the travel kind. You can't get enough water in there. But anything that has some kind of a reservoir where you put water and then use that water for the water pick is good. So uh, you, know, you, you, can get, you can get them fairly inexpensively now at any of those uh, uh, big box stores. And you want to use the middle pressure. You don't want to go to the highest pressure to do this because you can actually start creating more of a depthening, de depthening of the pocket uh, with, with the pressure. So medium is usually enough to really reach the, uh, the bottom of your pocket. And you don't have to have gum disease. Two, three million pocket, mil million pockets are also quite uh, receptive to, to getting cleansed with our irrigation device. And of course, lastly, it, this is a great thing to do, but you still want to go every six months to get your gums checked. If your dentist is not checking your gums every time that you go for a checkup, you need to switch. You need to find somebody who will be very conscientious of your gums and of gum disease, because that's really one of the biggest challenges for your health. OK. Uh, this is another big, big question, and for me, it's been one of the most challenging issues in my practice, and this is a root canal controversy. Uh, who in this, uh, in this group has heard that root canals are not good for you? Okay. So traditionally, we have heard root canals are not. Well, but what do you do when a tooth is killing you, right? You're in terrible pain. You go to the dentist. He says, you need a root canal. It's a first molar, and you have to decide, what do I do? Do I do a root canal? Do I extract this tooth? If I extract this tooth, how is that going to impact my chewing ability, my quality of life? And if I extract it, do I replace it? Do I not replace it? So this is a challenging question, both for dentists and for, for the uh, patient, right? So these are some of the choices that we have to make. Now, what, what is happening when somebody needs a root canal in most cases? We have a tooth. Inside of here, we have a vein, an artery, and a nerve in a package going on the inside of the tooth. So usually when we need a root canal, it's because we've had a breakage on the tooth, on the integrity of the tooth, the white part, that has actually created or given the ability to bacteria to actually introduce themselves into the canal where there's a lot of blood supply, a lot of nourishment for them, and so it creates great inflammation. As you can see, if you get a tummy ache and it starts hurting you, you get the distended stomach and it eases off a little bit of the pressure and the pain. In the tooth, if you get that area inflamed, there's no place to go. It's against hard structures. That's why toothaches are, are so terrible. They're so difficult to manage. So what are the options to replace extracted teeth? Well, the first question is, let me back up a little bit. Do we extract it, or do we do a root canal? Now, a root canal, traditionally, a dentist will come in and remove all this tissue, which is soft tissue, infected tissue, and will actually fill these canals up to here, optimally, with a material. 
Some of the objections to root canals in the past, number one, is that you no longer have that blood supply from the inside of the tooth. Is that the only blood supply in the tooth? No, you also get blood supply from around the tooth. But yes, if you have a root canal, the tooth becomes a little bit more dehydrated, more brittle with less blood supply. But the biggest issue is not so much that. The biggest issue is that the filling materials that have been used in the past have been, number one, been hydrophobic, which means they hate moisture, and there's always going to be moisture. And so they actually contract and create spaces between the material and the tooth. Uh, the second problem is that they've been incredibly toxic. The materials used in root canals have been incredibly toxic in the past. So I, for many years, stopped doing root canals. I began about seven, eight years ago with the advent of new materials, where now we make a decision based on the individual. If you are a strong individual, not in, immune compromised, you're not dealing with a, a severe illness, I would consider doing a biocompatible root canal, where now I will fill those canals with a biocompatible ma material that's actually hydrophilic, expands and seals the material really well, not giving place to those gaps that we had before, where the bacteria used to actually get in there and colonize. If I have somebody that is immune compromised, you know, somebody who's dealing with a severe challenge in, with their health, then we have to look at the big picture. We don't want to keep a possible focus of infection in the mouth when you're dealing with such a severe issue. So again, trust yourself, trust the people that you're around to make good decisions. Look at the big picture. Don't just go with what you've read on the internet. So I'm giving you information here so you guys can actually make good decisions for yourself together with your health professional. Now, if once we've decided we've extracted the tooth, uh, what do we do? Implants, fixed bridges, removal bridges, Maryland bridges. So those are the four most common options that we consider in our practice. Implant, advantage. Advantage of the implant, they're solid. They integrate really well to the, to the teeth right now. Uh, they have about a 97% success rate. Uh, some of the challenges with the implants. First of all, they're made out of metal. Do you want metal in your bone if you have a dealing with big issues and allergies and metal problems in your mouth or uh, you're, uh, you're immune compromised? I would not suggest that you do that. If you're healthy, if you, this is an important tooth to replace, uh, you have no, no major issues, then that's, that's a possibility. Uh, some of the uh, problems in the past is that there was leakage in here, right between the, the uh, uh, implant and the tissue where there was leakage in bacterial infection. Nowadays, the designs of the implants have improved where that's becoming less of a problem. But again, decision time. Don't just think it's always this way or always that way, you know. Use the information you have to make good decisions. Removable bridges, probably the, they're, they're, they're very, very uh, non-invasive. You basically are putting something in there as long as you have relatively good biocompatible materials, but they're not necessarily the best for your quality of life. It's something you have to put in and out all the time, and as people that wear them will tell you, some people will adjust really well to them. Some don't, and they usually end up in the drawer with a lot of the other things that, all the other gadgets that they've bought and they can't use. Fixed bridge, uh, where we would actually take two teeth on the sides, we would reduce them, and then we would actually place a bridge in there. Uh, nowadays, we've gotten to the point where we can actually do bridges without any metal whatsoever, biocompatible bridges new material called Bruxer that is uh, as hard as, as they come. It's actually uh, not a hybrid material. It's very biocompatible. And you can take a hammer to that bridge and try to break it. You can't. So uh, you know, the disadvantages is the, are that you maybe sometimes have two pristine teeth on the side. You don't want to grind those teeth, right? But if you have two crowns already there, it's a no-brainer. So again. Use the information to make good decisions. And lastly, a Maryland bridge, where if you sometimes have certain parts of the mouth 
where you can get enough retention. You don't have a you know, 300-pound wrestler that is going to put a lot of pressure on every bite. Sometimes we can actually get away without having to grind the whole tooth and just do a partial design and do a Maryland Bridge, which used to be in vogue about 30 years ago. Then people stopped using them, and now with the advent of better bonding materials, we're able to come back to those types of designs successfully. And that's basically what you have to, instead of preparing the whole crown, you just actually have to remove a uh, uh, much lesser amount of, of enamel of the tooth to, to get that bridge. Now, what materials can you use in crowns and bridges? Porcelain to metal. And then the metals are non-precious, semi-precious, and precious. No matter what metal you're using, unless you're using pure titanium, they're all different amalgamated metals. Not, not to be confused with amalgams. There is really no mercury there. But amalgamated, and a lot of them have platinum, nickel, so forth. And then you have no metal crowns, some lava emacs and empress that are bilayered, which means you have a core and then a beautiful overlay of, of uh, porcelain. And then you have the pure zirconia. The pure zirconia is by far the most biocompatible material and the best crown from a health point of view. However, sometimes we don't use them in the front because they're not quite as beautiful as the uh, bilayered. So again, if you really don't want to have a kind of dead looking bridge or, or some crowns in front, then you might want to choose to go by layer. And if it's an area where it doesn't show or you just really don't care, you can always use the pure zirconia called Bruxer crown. And again, you know, it's about creating a good team around you guys, trusting the right people, trusting yourself most of all, to, to know when to trust and when not to trust. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I have a personal website where I talk a little bit more about my urban farming, my tilapia growing, my trees, my, you know, a lot of my meditation practices, and a little bit of my philosophy on dentistry. And then, of course, the office website and email, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have if you feel shy to uh, ask them now or if you come up with some questions later on. I'll leave that up for a couple more minutes, and then I'll put this back. So I hope I brought some good information for you guys, and uh, uh, you can go back and, and, and really learn how to really trust your own instincts. And with some information, put those things together, like the Chinese, you know, use your heart, use your mind at once. And thank you very much. So I'll, I'll open the forum. We have about 10, 12 minutes for questions, if anybody would like to. Now, unfortunately, because of my dentistry, I've lost a little bit of my hearing. That, that <laughs> is not, all, not only bad for the, uh, for the patients, but uh, we've lost our hearing a little bit. So if you can speak up, I would appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for your information. But uh, whenever there is a dental uh, treatment uh, issue, there, there are issues of uh, affordability, especially. Of? Uh, affordability. Uh, aff affordability. So especially if you have four, five, six, uh, you know, issues Correct. in your teeth. So are there any affordable version as well as uh, better healthy options? Uh, especially if somebody wants to go to Mexico and do it there or right. those kind of things. Right. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm, you know, I'm in San Diego, so often there are people that you know, don't have insurance and have a hard time affording. And you know, that is a big question. There's a big problem. Uh, I used to have a really good friend who went to USC with me and opened a practice in, in uh, Tijuana. And I used to send all those patients to him. Uh, I have not seen a lot of really, really great work coming back from Tijuana, although I'm sure there's some great people. And if you have a really good dentist, please let me know, because I, I am sure they're there. I just haven't found I'm sure they're there. Uh, so I couldn't recommend somebody down there. The costs are much less there. Uh, you know, the cost of uh, labor is less and no insurance and things like that. So they're able to keep their prices lower. And if you don't find somebody like that, I would suggest that uh, you have to, you know, maybe make some compromises. First of all, is what we do for our patients is we do a treatment plan. This is where you are now. 
this is where I want you to be, where you want to be, in perfect health. Uh, from here to here, sometimes there's a little path to go, sometimes there's a huge chasm, right? Uh, and so we try to take priorities and start even slowly going a bit at a time, you know, just working on what needs to be, making sure that we're moving forward. And so uh, aside from that, sometimes you have choices to make. Uh, you can replace, for example, amalgams with composite materials, or you can replace them with porcelain. Porcelain would be preferable. It's a much more biocompatible solution. However, if there are issues with finances, sometimes you can replace them with a good composite material. Now, most of the composites, or I think every composite material that I know in the market has BPAs with the exception of one that's called beauty fill. And that's the one we use in our office. It has no BPAs. But having said that, I will really encourage people who have very large amalgams not to use that because those materials will break down and will erode. And when you have smaller restorations, then it's not a problem. You know, you can use composites very successfully, and we do that as well. So we try to be uh, conscientious about people's financial struggles, too. And, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a reality. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, hello. To, to take out the traditional root canal or do this replacement with these biocompatible materials, what, what is the, um, uh, is it an operation? Is it a big thing to take out the roots or it is better to fill them with this biological thing or, um, I don't know, I would I'm, like you to. I'm not sure I understand your question, but let's, yeah. let's work with yeah. this. No, root canals. Yeah. Yeah, so, so in a root canal, we're basically, the, the, let, me, let me see if I can go back enough to. How do you take it off? Ow. Okay, so you understand the root canal is actually, they take off only the inside here. The tooth stays in place. Everything stays in place. They're only taking out this little material here, which is like a, a, a little bit of tissue, yes? So a traditional root canal, they remove this, they enlarge this area a little bit, and then they fill it with material. Now, that's, the, that's what a root canal is. A, a biocompatible root canal, the only difference between the two is that a biocompatible uh, material is used to fill this area right here. But how do you take that out? The... Okay, now a lot of patients come over to try to change all root canals for a, a new root canal, for a biocompatible root canal. And then we decide whether we want to just take the tooth out or if we want to retreat this with biocompatible material. So a lot of the times, uh, dentists put very large metal posts to reconstruct the tooth into this canal. When that happens, there's no way to retreat the tooth, and the tooth needs to be extracted if it's becoming a problem. If the post, if it, if it doesn't have large posts, and I would say about 30% of the time we cannot retreat them, about 70% of the time we can retreat them. So what we do is we have special computerized machinery that the, the rotary files that we go in there and actually remove all the material. The tooth still stays in place. Nothing has happened to the tooth. It's only the inside. It's like a tunnel inside that gets worked on. So we would go in here and remove all the old toxic material and refill it with a biocompatible material. Which is not toxic at all. Which is all. not toxic. Actually, it's a material, it's, it's, it's a lot, uh, uh, it's a calcium hydroxide based and they use it a lot in hip replacements and knee replacements to regenerate bone. So if you take this material and just put it here on the bone, the bone will grow around it quite happily. Dr. Vinaigrette, I have one from the live stream. Does rinsing with hydrogen peroxide prevent most gum infections? Some dentists believe it introduces free radicals and may be toxic to rinse with. Yes. Uh, I agree. I don't think it's the best solution. It will kill bacteria, and some people will use it. Sometimes we'll use 50-50 with water, and some people will use bacteria. But having, you know, having an option of doing that or, or, or ozone, which is just plain oxygen, it's, it's a no-brainer. Why would you want to use anything that's irritating and creates uh, free radicals when you, I mean, it will do the job in cleaning the bacteria, number one. Number two is it will only reach 
bacteria on the surface, if you're just rinsing, it's not really going to help you much unless you're using a water pick with that to really deliver the, the uh, material deeply into the gums. So we have two issues. One is the delivery system. We want to have a delivery system to get to the bottom of the pocket. And second is we want the most biocompatible, clean type of uh, substance that will kill the bacteria. Um, ozone therapy has been proven to be much more effective than even antibiotic th therapy in killing bacteria, anaerobic bacteria inside the pockets uh, without any side effects. I mean, you're basically introducing uh, oxygen concentrated water. And uh, I'll be right there. And then, um, how do you avoid cavitations when having teeth removed, such as wisdom teeth? How do? How do you avoid cavitations when having teeth removed, such as wisdom teeth? Okay, well, cavitations has a, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, different definitions for different people. Uh, we don't use the word cavitation anymore for legal, uh, because of its legal implications. There have been dentists have been sued because they were claiming they were doing cavitations. So I will address mostly what the concern is, which is when a tooth gets infected, the bone around it gets infected. And so sometimes when dentists extract the tooth, and don't go back in there and really scrape that infected bone. And often, especially in wisdom teeth, not only you have infected bone, but you have a little sac that was actually engulfing the tooth as it was coming out, and, and it was never dissolved, and that creates at times, often enough, it creates cysts in the area. So you gotta get in there and get that, that little sac out as well as any infected bone around it. So you just want to have a dentist that will be conscientious and, and go in there and really clean anything that is infected around the tooth. For example, if you have a tooth extracted for orthodontic reasons that is not infected, really there's no issue. But res the issue is when you have an infection and the tooth has actually uh, moved into the, into the uh, bone tissue. I have two questions, doctor. One on them. Root canal, do yes. you have to be an endodontist to do that? Uh, I'm not an endodontist. I probably do, you know, five or six root canals a week. Okay. So, so you, you don't, don't No, you don't have to be. Uh, there are times when you want an endodontist to do it. Uh, I don't refer my patients to endodontists because I don't, haven't found anybody in San Diego who's using the biocompatible materials. That's good. That's good. Uh, and nowadays we have computerized systems. It's not what it used to be. Uh, endodontics used to be quite uh, complicated before. We use a rotary system that is connected to a computer, and I go in there, and it tells me exactly when I've reached the very tip here, and it auto-reverses. My partner calls it uh, root canal for, what, is it, what are those books? Dummies. For dummies. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's become a lot less complicated to do a root canal. We usually do a root canal in about an hour from beginning to end. But now it's shorter time? Shorter time, okay. yeah, better materials, better mm -hmm. instruments, and so okay. forth. Having said that, there might be some cases that are complicated enough that need to be referred to the, the endodontist. And of course, the dentist it's, himself needs to feel comfortable with the endodontic mm -hmm. procedure. So it's, it varies from person to person. Another question, mm -hmm. sir. You mentioned about the uh, using of the water pick. Is it, and the mouthwash. Uh, what do you say about the mouthwash? And no, no, it's not a mouthwash. It's actually a machine. No, no, but I'm talking about the mouthwash. You know, when you put the water in the water pick, you know, the water container. Correct. Is it uh, advisable to you to put the water, I mean, the mouthwash in there or do the mouthwash after you do that? No mouthwash. I, I've never advocated mouthwash. Okay, so you Yeah, I think mouthwash is uh, dehydrate the tissues. They have high uh -huh. levels of alcohol. I don't advocate mouthwash at all. So not at all? No. Okay. The only thing I'm advocating is using an ozone generator machine. You have a little tube. It has a head on it. You put it on the container with the regular water, purified water, hopefully. Purified. And you let it sit there for 15 minutes, and that becomes your super mouthwash. Thank you. Yes. We have one, another one, Dr. Vinograd, from sure. the uh, chat room. This is from Mary, and she's looking at you from this camera. And she's asking, are there any problems biologically with the materials used in dentures, traditionally used in dentures? Uh, Yes, there, there, ha there have been quite a number of, of uh, uh, 
for, for a susceptible person, you really must be quite careful in the materials that you, that you use. Um, materials have advanced quite a bit. Uh, they've become a lot less toxic. Uh, they're now flexible partials that are being used that are quite uh, benign and also easy to use. So yeah, you want to make sure that you are using uh, materials from the last generation of dental materials versus some of the older materials that had quite a bit of toxins and, and heavy metals. I would like to ask you, what do you think about removing bacteria by oil? That's my first question. Oil pulling. Oil, yeah. And the second question, whether you recommend or whether you don't recommend the mouthwash at all, or what it does, what's good on it, and what is not good for on no. OK, what's good in it is that you're making a lot of, a lot of uh, stockholders very wealthy. <laughs> And, and it also gives you a nice fresh feeling. And then you can join the commercials and jump around with the people who are jumping around in the commercials with good breath. Uh, it does give you good breath for a very short period of time. And the alcohol kills some bacteria. What's bad about it is that it has a lot of alcohol that hydrates the tissues. It's just really not a good, and, and, and it's usually they're, they have, uh, they're chemically loaded. So I would not use uh, mouthwash at all. Natural, if you want to use ozonated water as a mouthwash, that w will work better and longer than a mouthwash. It doesn't give you your initial, oh my god, I taste like uh, mint, you know, or I smell like mint, but, but it'll really be effective. You're being effective in killing, because what gives you, there are two reasons most, most of the time you have bad breath. One is going to be dental issues, gum disease particularly, or GI tract problems. If a GI tract problems, no matter what you do in your mouth, it's not going to solve it because your problem is coming from deep inside. If it's a problem with your mouth, with your gums, and so forth, inflammation, the, the ozonated water will work much, much better than any possible commercial mouthwash. The first part of, of your question. Oil pulling. Oil pulling. Oil pulling, right. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, research on oil pulling, a lot of information out there. I feel that is a very valid uh, 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 protocol, and a lot of my patients use it. But again, uh, you are, you know, you are going to be much more effective with the ozone if, if your purpose is to kill bacteria. Much more effective. Uh, remember again that the anaerobic bacteria are the ones that cause most of the damage in the mouth, both in caries and in, in your uh, gum disease. And that's the ones that are going to be killed by the ozone. So, Question for you. <clears throat> Recently visited my dentist, and we had a discussion about mercury fillings. And, yes. And I said, I want to take them all out. And he advised against that because right. he thought that some of them, he thought that the ones that I had, um, he had taken one out, put a crown in, and, uh, but the other ones were not, didn't show any leakage and looked good. And I just wanted your opinion on that. Would you leave them in, or would you say, look, if you want them out, and you and You, you know, can... in my book, the only good amalgam is a dead amalgam, or <laughs> one that's out of the mouth. Uh, yeah, I don't, you know, eventually those amalgams are going to cause you trouble. So the question is, do you want to take a chance, play Russian roulette, to decide whether in the long run, oh, you know, he was right or he was right? Maybe he's right. Maybe they're causing no problems. Could be. 100 years, 200 years from now, maybe we'll have the answer. But why would you want to keep something in there that is 50% mercury, third most toxic material that we know, and that eventually is going to end up cracking your teeth? It, isn't it better to really remove them now before physical damage takes place? And when you still have the question mark. I mean, in my book, there's really no question. I would not keep a single amalgam in my mouth. But there you go. And we see that all the time, cracks. So a lot of the larger amalgams will inevitably, I'm putting money on the table right now that they will crack in time, sooner or later. So it really is a no-brainer. Yeah, you're welcome. For some of us that don't have the ozone water as of right now, is the, would you recommend the acidic water versus alkaline water to rinse your mouth that way? That's not going to make a lot of difference. Having said that, there are people that have slightly higher pH than others. If your pH is slightly higher, you will know that because you tend to build up a lot of tartar 
on your gums and have very little problem with decay. On the other hand, if you have very acidic saliva, you will tend to have a lot more decay and very little tartar. Those are the two extremes. Of course, there are people in between. If you have a very alkaline saliva where you're building a lot of tartar in your gums, I would use probably water with a slight amount of lemon in them or anything that will actually acidify it or, or uh, perhaps some, uh, some apple cider vinegar, just a little bit, just to bring the pH down a little bit so you don't have the issues with the uh, tartar formation. If you, on the other hand, you have uh, slightly more acidic and you're having a lot of problems with decay, there are two things you could do. One is put a little baking soda in the water to rinse. The other thing you could do is uh, use uh, xylitol, chewing gum, whatever that's been proven to really decrease uh, decay. And it's a fairly natural uh, sugar. I would, I, my son uses it. I wouldn't have any hesitation using that. You know, having said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, most of us can get a, a nozone generator, you know, a couple hundred dollars on the internet. Okay, I think we're going to try to sneak in one more. Okay. Doctor, for a, a younger kid who has um, um, hypothyroidism and has um, amalgam on some of the temporary uh, teeth, the baby, the baby's teeth, what how, do you... How old is the child? Nine. Nine years old. Yeah. What okay. do you recommend just to okay. wait it out? At nine years old, at, by 11, he's going to shed most, if not all, of his baby teeth. So being nine years old and having had the amalgams for a long time, yes? Ha, has he, he had those amalgam fillings for a long time? Yeah. So I'd, if, if, he, if he came to my practice, he's nine, and I would actually, you know, had fairly normal uh, uh, patterns as far as, uh, you know, the, the, the timing on the teeth coming out and so forth, I would probably not take him out. I would just let him come out on their own because, it's, you know, it's a very short period of time. He's going to have him out. And, you know, if, if he's not going to take, being ta if the amalgams are not being taken out properly, it's going to cause more damage than good. So at nine, I would probably wait it out. Well, that's going to have to do it, but I think we all appreciate your coming to us today. Let's give Dr. Vinegar well, a thank you. thank you. Thank you. So and much. I want to thank the Gerson Institute. They do an awesome job, and I'm proud to be associated with you guys. Yay. We're going to include in the in the in the email package that we send to you when next week when we get around to it or when when it's all compiled. We're going to include Dr. Vinograd's PowerPoint presentation, so you'll have all of that also. He just agreed to do it. Yay! <laughs> If you guys just want to take a couple more quick minutes to finish filling out your evaluations, and um, when, when we leave, we're going to put them out in the uh, holder that's out there in the hall. But I wanted to just take a moment to tell you how honored we were to have all of you here this weekend. It was absolutely fantastic. We were so excited that you came, and it's... Uh, Everyone at the Institute is very, very grateful for your participation in all of this. I also wanted to let you know that you may be leaving here this weekend with a mental illness. And I'm not making this up. Right now, the psychiatric community is debating whether or not to include a new diagnosis called orthorexia into their diagnostic and statistical manual. They're writing papers about it. They're really trying to gin up a lot of enthusiasm for this. And what orthorexia actually is, by their definition, is an unhealthy fixation on clean and healthy food. It is, they, it's an offshoot of anorexia, which is people who don't eat anything. And they are claiming that this can now potentially become a diagnosable mental illness for which they can prescribe psychiatric medication. I don't know about the rest of you, 
but I am perfectly happy to spend the rest of my days in the loony bin with the rest of you, toasting each other with glasses of carrot juice. Thank you all so much, so much for being with us. Be well, stay bold, and safe home.